Dedication, Preface, and Chapter 1 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication To my dear wife, in affectionate remembrance of many days of self-denial spent at sea with me. Preface Boating and yachting men may be roughly divided into two classes. Those who go to sea for the sake of competitive sport afloat, and those who do so for love of it, their boat and all that moves on the waters. A sporting yachtsman's craft is worthless to him after, owing to some change of racing measurement, she fails to end a season with a string of prize flags from topmast to bowsprit and boom ends. While as soon as the racing season is over, he quits the sea for the moors and stubbles. And though sometimes, as he grows older, a racing yachtsman here and there tones down into a cruiser, the line which marks him from the cruising yachtsman becomes, I think, more distinct every year. What may be called the seamanship of large racing craft and the watermanship of smaller ones is usually left to their skipper and crew. But much of a cruising yachtsman's pleasure consists in acquiring some knowledge of the details of handling his craft and of the seamanship required for making passages. While the smaller boating man, who loves it as an art, is equally desirous of becoming proficient in what may be termed watermanship, by which I do not mean the mere steering a boat under sail, but the art of placing her in varying conditions of wind, weather, and tide alongside a landing place or quay, boarding a vessel at anchor, picking up a mooring, getting under way, or bringing up in or from a crowded anchorage, mooring and legging up his boat on a hard for a scrub, etc. Beach work, again, is another distinct form of watermanship, and may be described as the art of launching or landing in a boat, under sail, or oar through a surf. Little, of course, can be taught or learnt about such matters in books. But people like to read of the accidents and experiences of others in any art they care for. I have, therefore, in the following pages of Water Biography, jotted down, among other personal experiences, one or two actual squeaks or shaves met with during a boating life of fifty years, hoping they may have some interest for the rapidly increasing number of those who delight in boat sailing and watermanship, and the healthy tax on mind and muscle entailed by it. Robert C. Leslie, Southampton, June eleventh, eighteen ninety four. Chapter One I am put into salt water. Make a voyage to America. Come back. Return to London. Want of education. Early pursuits there. Learn to swim. Don't run away to sea. 
Why? Explore the River Lee with a cousin. Don't get drowned in it. Milkmaids replaced by savages on its banks. Under fire on the lee. A council of war. Some dangers attending being able to swim. A drift seaward. Under a boat's bottom. I join a rowing club. Race with a Putney steamer and result. Ram a coal barge in an outrigger. An honest owner, etc. I was born a Cockney. Footnote 1. When this took place in 1826, there were genuine English Cockneys. Englishmen now are born all over the world, while London has so extended that it is not easy to be born a Cockney even there today. And first introduced to salt water by a stout, strong old lady of Brighton in a blue serge suit, who took me by main force from the top step of a little rickety bathing machine round which small waves were rolling, and selecting one of unusual size and fury, soused me under it. This she repeated three times, after which I scrambled into the machine again, with eyes, nose, and ears full of salt foam and sand. I was about four years old at this time, and remember seeing nothing of the sea afterwards until four years later I crossed the Atlantic for the first time in the Black X sailing packet, Philadelphia, and after six weeks at sea was told that a low line of flat gray cloud on the horizon ahead of the ship was American land, Long Island shore. Matters over which I had no control led, six months later, to another delightful trip over the sea in the same ship, and in three weeks to a sight of the chalk cliffs of the Isle of Wight. I have no recollection of any storm or nautical incident of importance during either of these voyages, nor even of seasickness, and was only sorry to change the pleasant deck of the little five hundred ton packet for the outside of the Portsmouth coach for London. Boys, however, never look far ahead, and a sail from the ship at Spithead to Portsmouth in a small cutter rig tender consoled me greatly at the time. Having now crossed the Atlantic twice in a full-rigged ship, I of course felt at once competent to take charge of anything in the shape of a boat. This was sixty years ago, and I have held that opinion ever since, and seldom missed the chance of doing so whenever one was offered. Luckily for me, being the eldest of a large and rapidly increasing family, I had the advantage of a judiciously intermittent and well-neglected education. And this period of my life appears now to me to have been one long half-holiday, spent on the banks of suburban ponds and canals, sailing homemade model boats, or bathing, and catching sticklebacks and gudgeon. Nothing, I think, tends more to habits of self-reliance than an early and well-neglected education. But my Pickwickian tastes for the margins of the Hampstead and other suburban ponds led my father, about this time, to try and add the art of swimming to my other desultory studies, and I was handed over to an old boatman of Margate, 
who professed to teach me this noble art at the rate of two shillings a lesson. This was a mistake, for perhaps if the job had been a contract one, I might have learned something even from this experienced old expert. As it was, I really first learnt to keep my head above water in the Paddington Canal, finishing my education in the old Holborn Baths, and that then deep, treacherous lake, the Serpentine. According to all ordinary or well-regulated water biographies, I ought now to at once have a comfortable home and indulgent parents, and stow myself away on board a collier brig, or on what I should then have liked better, one of the great brown-sailed Thames barges. The course of true sea love should, I know, run in this direction, but even love of the sea does not always run smoothly, and in my case was probably marred by a too early personal observation of some aspects of real life on the ocean wave before the mast, so that even after a long course of study of my Robinson Crusoe and other nautical fiction, I never remember at any time being tempted to leave my base of operations on good family bread and butter by running away to sea. And thus it came to pass that at this time my most ambitious nautical rovings were limited to short inland explorations of that cockney haunt, the River Lee, where, near Upper Clapton, in the company of my cousin, a blue-coat boy of intensely nautical tastes, I spent what little pocket money I got in the hire of crank skiffs, well found not only in skulls, but mast, sail, and rudder. There were many other places nearer home where boats might be hired, but none where the owner of one fitted with mast and sail could be persuaded to trust it in the hands of enterprising youngsters of our experience. Most of the craft on the lee were owned by two old waterman brothers of the suggestive name of Solomon. And the chartering of one was always a serious matter, which my cousin, being a city man and a year older than myself, always negotiated. He was also the actual owner of a watch, which together with the combined cash in our pockets remained in the hands of the Solomons as a form of insurance upon their craft, or guarantee for the hire of her in case of accident to or desertion of her by the crew. General holidays or long summer Sunday afternoons were usually selected for these cruises, when, for the outlay of a shilling each, we were able to enjoy three or more hours of this kind of boating. And as both of us were agreed that sailing, whenever practicable, was the only mode of progression for boys of our nautical ability, a windy day was always chosen for them. It was upon one of these early cruises that I first nearly came to grief in a boat, by being carried by a strong current under the great water wheels of certain mills. Just above these mills was a low bridge, where in turning our boat she drifted, and we got her jammed broadside across it with the full strength of the stream running under her in such a way that any movement on our part to clear her 
caused her to heel over toward it until the water poured into her on that side. We at once saw that in a few seconds, if we capsized, we should be under those mill wheels, and this, I believe, made us keep quiet and think what was best to be done. Luckily, our mast was not up, and the bridge was wide enough if only we could get the boat round, head to stream, to use our skulls under it. So that, keeping very carefully amidships in the boat, and pulling the bow oar, with the after one ready the moment her head was round, after a few anxious moments we got out of this awkward fix, and clear of what we called that beast of a bridge with the strong dark stream below it divided counsels i think led to our getting athwart the bridge and before we were clear of it the importance of one directing head in cases of emergency became evident to us both this incident however had the effect of much increasing our confidence not only in small boats but ourselves because we both felt that it did not happen through any fault of the boat while as to our share in it the truth of the saying was evident that it takes a good man to keep out of trouble but a better one to get out of it sunday boating in those days was looked upon by people who did not indulge in it as a surer road to ruin than it is to-day. While at the end of the journey it was then easier to get hung than now. We were therefore both logically safer from a watery grave than boys of the present day. While to save any anxiety in home circles, all such expeditions were really carried out under sealed orders that is on the sly in those days the river lee was for the most part a quaint silvery stream which quite near london still wandered among cowslip banks and green meadows as it did when old isaac walton and his scholar venator angled in it for trout and chub walton's milkmaid maudlin and her mother had however long vanished from its shores their place being filled in our time by dark native races engaged in the discharge of brick and coal barges harmless savages enough on working days but I shall not easily forget one Easter morning afternoon when a gang of twenty or more of them had gathered on two barges moored to a coal wharf, and under the influence of much strong Waltham ale, etc., were killing time between their drinking bouts by discharging coal not on to the wharf, but into every passing pleasure boat on our outward voyage the coast was clear of them and no doubt they were then all busy over pots and pipes but on our return the moment we opened the bend of the river where the barges lay we saw what was in store for us so long as a boat had females on board even these light-hearted roughs let her pass with some innocent river chaff and a handful of coal dust but whenever a boat manned only by lads hove in sight they poured a heavy broadside of lumps of coal into her as long as she was within range this blockade had to be run and a council of war therefore was held on board our skiff as to the best tactics to be followed. We had observed among the boats on the river that day 
that the crews of many consisted of boys or lads who, though not able to return the Coley's material fire for lack of ammunition, were well supplied both as to quality and quantity with strong below-bridge slang, the effect of which was rather to concentrate the Coley's fire on these boats. After resting, therefore, on our oars for a time out of range, we determined to start under convoy of one of these boatloads of young roughs, on the principle that a big lump of coal could not pitch into more than one boat at any time. We were lucky in the selection of a very foul-mouthed convoy, closely following which, until abreast the Coley's battery, we put on a spurt, and with faces toward the shower of black missiles, were quickly out of range, with nothing more than one bruised finger and a splashing thrown on board by some large lumps of coal which just missed our boat. Many smaller ones fell into her and were carried back as trophies of war to the brother Solomon, who merely remarked that they would elp bile the kettle, which stood upon a rusty old boat stove in their riverside cabin. But the playful conduct of these natives of the banks of the Lee gave us rather a shake as to the pleasures of boating upon it on a general holiday. Being able to swim, of course, gives confidence in the water, but after a long boating experience, I am inclined to think that at times the mere fact of being a swimmer leads to risks from which a non-swimmer would be exempt. I do not, of course, mean danger incurred by jumping into deep water to save another's life, one I have never personally had the honor of running, but in the course of over fifty years boating I am able to recall only one case in which I can really say that I owed my life to being able to swim. While I know of more than one risk which would never have been run had I been unable to do so. The first happened through my early preference for a plunge from a boat in place of a sea bath from the shore. I had with me a younger brother and had got the loan of a punt or dinghy belonging to one of the cow's pilots when lodging with him, or rather his missus, at Bembridge and after rowing down to deep water in the mouth of that little haven, and finding the tide taking us faster seaward than I expected, I threw over the boat's painter with a small grapnel attached, to keep her in place while I undressed. This would have been all right had I weighed anchor again before going overboard, which boy-like, of course, I did not do with the result that when, after some easy strokes down tide, I endeavored to regain the boat, I found that, spite of hard swimming, I was steadily and surely drifting away from her toward the sea. My brother was a mere child, so that I was practically alone and I remember feeling more bothered as to what he would do left alone in the boat than about myself. But with a rapidly widening channel to right and left, there was little time to think, and less to waste in a useless struggle against the strong ebb tide. I therefore shaped the course downstream and toward the nearest shore, and after a time, to my great relief, was able to gain soundings, and the land, though a long way from my boat clothes and little brother. The rest was easy enough, for after a short repose 
I had merely to run back along shore until far enough above the boat to regain her with the tide. I need not say that this was my last attempt at a bath from anything anchored in a strong tideway. I was at this time a fairly good swimmer above water, but had given little attention to the valuable art of diving and swimming under water, until bathing one day with some friends from a broad, rather flat-bottomed boat off Brighton, I tried to follow an experienced underwater swimmer, who dived easily below the boat, coming up on the opposite side, and was much surprised at finding myself firmly jammed up against the boat's bottom and keel in the buoyant salt water. In such a position, one cannot take long to decide on what to do. But I must have remained some time under the boat before I cleared myself by placing one foot against her keel as a bearing to strike from, for I felt her lurch from side to side more than once. Caused, I found afterwards, by my friends on board moving quickly across her to see on which side I would come up. I am not certain now whether it was to starboard or port, but after this first experience of some of the sensations of a keel haul, I took care, next time I tried it, to dive deep enough to allow me time to turn and swim under the boat clear of her bottom. A bold, first-rate swimmer, bathing from the shore, constantly runs greater risks than one who dare not venture far beyond his depth, or than any one bathing from an unmoored boat. The strong swimmer will dive through the first line of breakers, and start seaward for a quarter of a mile or more beyond them, at which distance, in rough water, he is nearly lost to sight, and if seized by cramp, quite helpless. Again, in all ordinary boat accidents, people find themselves not only in the water, but their clothes, and it is not so much the weight of these which impedes a swimmer as the greatly increased surface friction which reduces his speed almost to nothing. The truth is that in such cases swimming should mainly be relied on as a means of support in the water aided, whenever possible, by sticking to the boat, or if she goes down to anything remaining afloat. I once picked up a man in Erith Reach, who had capsized his sailing canoe. There was a strong wind and tide, but I felt pretty sure of him, because I saw that he had an arm over the bottom of his canoe. After hauling him into my boat, I asked him by chance whether he could swim, and was not a little surprised at the answer of, Not at all. He was a small, delicate-looking person, and there was quite a little boiling sea on where he was capsized. On the other hand, he was a teetotaler, which accounted, perhaps, for the quiet nerve he showed in difficulties. I have also never forgotten the fate of a strong young swimmer, who with a friend was swamped on a stormy dark evening in an old-fashioned pair oar or racing wherry. The wind was against the tide, and the water so rough that their boat took in wave after wave, until she rolled over with them in crossing the river above Vauxhall Bridge. 
the strong swimmer at once got hold of his companion who could not swim and showed him how to support himself with his arms across the bottom of the boat and then struck out himself for shore to obtain help the man on the boat held on until picked up below the bridge by a waterman and at once hurried off to his boat club at westminster expecting to find his friend there nothing however was heard of him again until his body was recovered a fortnight later this sad incident is fixed in my memory because shortly after it i joined the club to which this boat belonged and heard of it first on board her on a windy night near where it happened this club's racing wherry or in-rigged pair oar was then considered the fastest boat of her kind on the river and i may say that it was in her under the able teaching of an older member that i first learnt to really pull an oar the headquarters of london boat clubs were then at searles near westminster bridge and many young men engaged all day in town met on summer evenings for a pull up to putney and back ours was an old-fashioned city club real watermen then plied on the thames and like them our uniform was a single-breasted long-waisted blue cloth coat with upright collar and a wide skirt set in pleats around the waist as the evenings grew short in autumn our return trips from putney were mostly after dark and the club wherry which was nearly always at our disposal being rather a low ticklish craft we had to be careful in her when crossing the wider reaches of the river from point to point to avoid filling her in lumpy water on all these trips during daylight we of course tried speed with every decent pair or four-oared boat we fell in with also with the old-fashioned river steamers which we could hold easily for a short time but in one of these spurts just below putney bridge while keeping too close to a steamboat to speak some members of our club on board her a big swell not one of our club ran over the wherry's bow and filled her up to the thwarts the following one swamped her and though we contrived to keep her right side up under us we had to get out into the river as soon as we reached soundings under a fire of chaff from our friends and drag her to shore before we could empty her and re-embark outrigged boats had then only just come into fashion and our club did not own an outrigged pair oar so that whenever my friend and i wished to practice in one we had to hire the boat being the heavier and longer man i always pulled the stroke or after oar and had therefore little to do with the pilotage of the boat my companion however was a good oarsman and river pilot so that i was much astonished one evening on a return trip from putney in one of these hired outriggers with a strong ebb tide at finding myself on my back in the bottom of the boat with my feet in the air and on looking forward to see how in the same position and beyond him a black bluff bowed boat into which nearly eighteen inches of the sharp beak of our narrow craft was firmly sticking this was just below battersea bridge and the first thing i remember doing was sounding with my oar close alongside the boat for bottom and finding it 
to keep that oar stuck upright in the river mud close to the boat, so that she might not slew with the tide and break her nose off in the bow of the barge or large boat we had rammed. Bow then crawled forward as far as he safely could, and with his oar placed against the planking of the barge, tried to shove our craft astern. She proved, however, to be too firmly wedged, and we at once decided that the only thing to be done was for us to both roll carefully out of her on opposite sides at the same moment, and then try and haul her nose out of the hole. The river here was not quite breast high, and we had barely got over this very ticklish operation and were wading ashore with the outrigger in order to get into her again when we saw that we had become objects of interest to a grimy-looking person pulling hard against tide in a heavy boat toward the barge. Here, no doubt, was the owner or skipper of the barge. He kept an eye over his shoulder on us between each stroke, but did not waste breath in words until close alongside our boat, when, as he followed us ashore, he opened fire with, A nice afternoon's work you been and done? We replied at once by asking, What was the damage for the hole in his rotten old barge? And began to think, we had to deal with an honest fellow when, after a moment's thought, he mentioned ten shillings as the very lowest figure what any one would take for to repair the damage we had done. Pointing out that, to make anything like a job of it, four planks would want shifting. We were in flannels, and the joint contents of our damp pockets was three shillings and six pence. The honest fellow was, however, very civil, and readily took this small installment, saying that with our names and that of our club he was quite satisfied. As it turned out, we never saw or heard anything again of that grimy man, so that perhaps, after all, he had merely a passing interest in the barge, or the hole in her. We were also greatly surprised and relieved on examining the slight brass-bound beak of the outrigger to find it was hardly scratched, because, being a hired boat, if she had left her nose in the barge, the cost of her repair would have fallen entirely on us, instead of being shared by the club. We never, of course, gave the hole in the barge a second thought. Looking upon her very much as the burglar in Punch did the coal scuttle left by some careless person in the passage of a house, and over which he broke his shins in the dark. Naval experts who look to the ram as a means of offense in sea fights of the future are welcome to the above practical little experiment, which was made just as related some years before rams or ironclads were thought of. The rather dry, brittle planking of the barge, which was clench-built, was nearly an inch thick, while our speed would be almost eight miles an hour. End of chapter one.